It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. What's happening, everybody? Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gents, to Mean Age Daydream. I am your host, Brian McWilliams, and I'll be joined today by a very special guest. But before I bring him on, I wanted to tell you guys a couple quick updates we got over here. Number one is if you want to get in on the Q&A that we're going to be doing with Robbie the Fire Bernstein, come and join our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty or lionsofliberty.locals.com. Going to be doing that next Tuesday, a Q&A for our $15 and up people where you can ask Robbie anything, uh, literally anything you want. Uh, how deep is his anal cavity? It's all on the table, folks. So jump in there. Please uh, support our show and have some fun doing it. Also be recording an episode with him. So there's that. Number two, I'm going to be doing a bonus segment with today's guest talking about how you can go from concept to creation, getting things made and how he did it. And that guest is the one of the only Matt Battaglia. Welcome to Mean Age Daydream, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me on. Very excited yeah, for to be sure. here. For sure, man. Well, you know, I got a I got an email about the new graphic novel you have, which is called House on Fire, mm -hmm. and uh, which I read it, I loved it. We'll talk about it in just a moment. But great. you know, I, I was like, oh, this is great because I, you know, obviously I uh, I saw you work for Free the People. Mm -hmm. I am uh, lucky enough to consider Matt and Terry friends of mine, so I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Get Matt in here and uh, and you can talk a little bit about the book, the work you do with them. And and yep. by the way, I was off my tits hammered at freedom fest in vegas <laughs> so i can't remember if you and i had met one night late at the rum bar or not did that it's happen entirely <laughs> it's it's entirely possible i too uh was was uh definitely not sober in vegas yeah. so <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah because it's like it was uh, one of those things where it was like yeah, I, I met think, like four was, people and I was there a idea. bathtub drink there or something yeah, I think so. Yes. Then yes, we were there. Uh, I, okay. I I have no recollection of. of yeah, <laughs> I have very very small recollection I, of it at that point in time. Freedom Fest was uh, a month before um, my uh, my wife was due with our first, so yeah. I was uh, I figured it was my last hurrah, basically. Yeah, it was your dad chillerette <laughs> party, as they say. Uh -huh. And what yes, better sir. place than Vegas to go? Uh, well, why not? so you know, welcome to the show. We've got this. You know, it, obviously a very timely book which is house on fire there you go graphic novel i've got the pdf because i want to i as we talk here i'm going to i don't want to give any spoilers away because you won't be able to buy it but i do want to mm -hmm. show a little bit about the style of the book here actually i'll bring up the, uh, sure. the pdf right now just so you can see it and it's an interesting aspect of it because it's very i'd say raw in the way it's presented and mm -hmm. it's you know it's an interesting artistic take on it that I want to get into as well. But, you know, it's very visceral. It's red and orange, or I'd say orange and black and white. Um, it just gives a lot of emotion to a lot of the writing in there, seeing how, I guess, rough hewn the sketches are. It makes you think yeah. that there's an urgency to it. It makes you think that it's very gritty, which, of course, it is. So tell me a little bit about how this book came into play. Uh, what okay. made you think about it? How did it, you know, how did your mind work around it? And how long did it take you to, to actually come up with the concept and get it on paper? So uh, I'll try to break that down. The, the first um, attempt at it, I did, I think, May 20th of 2020. So I drew like a page and it was called Delivery at the time. And the general story was, was different. It was set, um, it opened in a city rather than closing in a city. Um but so that was my first temp attempt. I drew a page and then I didn't know where to go with it or like the story that I had come up with was too big and things kept happening in real life that kept <laughs> um, making the thing that I was drawing feel um, too real, <laughs> basically. Yeah, <right. laughs> so um, later on that, um, I think in July, I did a uh, I drove down to Texas uh, with my dad um, from Philly to Texas and the story that became house on fire started to take shape in um sketchbooks um my dad had bought a rv um just before the pandemic and so um he obviously wasn't letting anyone else drive it so in spite of my attempts to uh 
get behind the wheel of it. Uh, I was refused. So I sat with the sketchbook and, uh, and basically wrote out notes that became house on fire. I drew uh, a few pages when I got back and then I shelved it again because uh, it just was, it was, it, it kept being too, too close to what kept happening in reality. And I just wasn't ready to, 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 uh, to fully commit to it. So I think, uh, what year are we in? 2023 right now. So early 2022, I finally sat down. I figured out, I, I don't remember what the spark was, but I had finally figured out the end, like, or the, like the end point for me, which was changing the beginning around. Um, mm. And, and focusing a lot more on just establishing him and his wife at the beginning and I think drawing that scene, I had drawn, I drew like three pages of that scene and I ended up redrawing those pages, but that, that, that clicked it all for me because the outline of events didn't change too much from that second draft, but um, I simplified it. The original version was way more of an action kind of film. Mm-hmm. And there was going to be a huge, all these huge shootouts and stuff. And I, I stripped all that stuff out because it, um, I think it kind of it it took away from the emotion of what House on Fire became. Yeah, and it's very. I mean, there is a a lot of suspenseful buildup. You know, it's not a really text heavy graphic novel. It's it's very much. It, you you feel as though you're in the character's mind as he's going through, and this is a story based around the pandemic. Um, you know, as you said, real to life, and basically a, a health fascist state. Um, Elements of totalitarian control that we see, you know, playing out with checkpoints, well, a very China-like system of entry when it comes mm-hmm. to scanning where you're allowed to go and, and your vaccine status. And of course, a denial of medical care, which happens in the book. And again, I don't want to give too much away here, but with the lead character having to obtain a denied medical substance that has been nationalized and rationed by the state and having to go through quite a bit of violence to get there yes. um so it's a fair way of describing it uh-huh. <laughs> yeah no that, it, it is and I, I i think that um the thing that i really wanted to do with it and the reason why it's not super word heavy and it's all it's fun talking to people now about the book now that it's, it's out and people have been reading it is how much people are reading um reading into it because a lot of what you just said isn't explicitly um told in you know in dialogue it's it's established in the images and and uh, the fun thing with a graphic novel that's different from other art forms, like you know, writing a novel or making a movie or whatever, um, is that just even the way that you draw a picture can convey a certain amount of motion and mood and and, and uh, time and place to it. So um, I'm glad that you picked up on all that. It's uh, it's um, it was a lot of fun drawing it because I was able to work out all of this stuff on the page for myself. Well, tell me a little bit more about the stylistic choice. Now, is this is the style that we find? And I'll bring up uh, I'll bring up a, a photo so people on YouTube who are watching along can kind of see the style a style that's not going to again give away too much of what's happening. But tell me a little bit about your your style. Is this something that you adopted for this? There you go. Oh, that's good. Okay, let me let me find that page. I'll pull up that one. So, is this something that you had adopted specifically for? this novel or was it something that you were looking through and and just said, well, this is kind of like the way I like to draw in general. Everything I do is in this vein, you know, was it inspired by some other uh, artist that you had followed and you've been, been reading for quite some time. So um, for me, it's how I draw. The other thing though, that um, I made a conscious decision to draw, to ink it all with a brush. And I tried to do pages as quickly as possible to give it more of a, uh, like a tense feeling yeah and and just so it's not super labored over um there's definitely there's a lot of drawings that you know looking back at it these though that i would you know redraw them they're not perfect per se but i think that uh the look that i was going for was trying to to um capture again like that like a like a mood and 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 an emotion so that way when you're reading it you should you know hopefully the the mark making you know, makes you feel something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get if it was a sort of a photo real picture, if that makes sense. I, I think no, that a lot 100%. of, 
yeah like a lot of western comics right now are chasing after like uh like intense realism and and they're losing a lot of the cartooning and stylization and i i think that often that that makes it feel um stiff i mean it it that's not always the case there are plenty of artists who work in that style and they do an amazing job but for what i want to do with house on fire is I wanted people to have a visceral reaction. And so I thought that having an immediate sort of mark making would, would, you know, hopefully elicit that. Um, Paul Pope, I have a print, Paul Pope print, is a huge influence of mine. Um, he's a, and so I definitely have studied him a lot and he draws with a brush, st- a heavy, you know, he's got a heavy brush style. And if you haven't read his, uh, I think every libertarian has at some point been given a copy of Paul Pope's uh, Batman of Berlin comic, which is where well, Batman... I haven't yet. What the hell? Oh, is you this? haven't? Batman God. rescues uh, Ludwig von Mises <laughs> from the Nazis. Uh, <laughs> no, I've never even heard of this. How is this? You possible? never? Oh my God! Uh, wow, I have all a right, couple well... of originals from it over there, but you've never <laughs> oh, heard gotta, of that. I, order. I have no, to send that to I... you. All right, yeah, um, please. I, yeah, wait, send me a link. I'll, I'll grab wait, it. If I, let me, wait, you, Ramp for a minute. I'll just go grab it. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Right, yeah, yeah. I got to see this. This is too crazy. But yeah, it's it's really what's interesting too about this is I think this book. You know, it's he said it it does evoke a very emotional reaction. And I was thinking about the way in which the world has gone. You know, we're getting away a little bit from print editions of books. We're getting into uh, an area where a lot of thought control is occurring. And I was wondering in the process of writing this if it's almost while it's not a direct take from our current time, it is an extension that is very close to reality. And that is almost a marker in time to say, look, we have to remember that this happened where it was, no matter what gets memory hold. And almost as, you know, it reminded me of uh, Fahrenheit 451 in a way in what they're trying to do digitally and how we may enter a time when having physical books actually might be vitally important to us as far as remembering what happened to us as a culture. Yeah, I think that's you're spot on there. Uh, and and to me, that's why for for me, um, I, I you I sent you a book. You, I sent yeah, you a yeah, copy. Got, okay, yeah, cool. got it, got it right because, here. Yeah. Because I think okay. that's how you're. I I intend for someone to read it like this. I I don't yeah. think a PDF is actually the right way to read it. Uh, I think that you need to hold it and be able to put your nose in it. And I I um like you said with the digital stuff like if you just have something digitally, you have no idea what's going to happen with it. And, and you can edit culture. Um, in it. So one of the, the key reasons why I felt like I had to make house on fire and why I I'm trying to promote it as much as I am is because I, I hope it's part of a cultural record for, mm-hmm. for COVID. And I don't think that there's enough of it. Um, it and I think that that's why we're seeing people be able to memory hole a lot of things that happened and there's not a whole heck of a lot of things outside of, you know, uh, tweets and blog articles um, that aren't really lasting things um, to remind people of what, what occurred here. Yeah. So I, I hope house on fire is one of those things kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you think about music and there were so many records produced in the aftermath of nine 11 in the aftermath of, um, the war on terror that were and movies as well, but that we're dealing with those things and grappling with, with what happened. And there just isn't, I, I haven't seen a lot of that out of COVID. No, neither and have I. So. And I think that's very intentional. It's almost reminds me of that article that was written. I, I can't remember if it was the Washington post or where it might've been some left-wing news outlet, but basically begging and say, look, we got it wrong. It was written by a leftist saying, we got it wrong. We should just be forgiven. Can't we all move along? And I think that's what they intentionally are trying to do is say, let's just move along. This was nobody's fault. It happened. It's a thing guys. Why are you dwelling on it? Right. And we can't permit that. No, no, it's, 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 it's insane. And, and uh, it's, I just don't, I don't think that we should do allow that to happen. And th- I'm sure there are people who who uh, who would like that to happen who maybe aren't culpable for something. They're just they had bad takes in the moment. But uh, there are a lot of people in positions of power who are not going to experience any ramifications for it and are going to uh, keep the um, 
keep the levers of power that they that they used in COVID open to themselves. So uh, unless if we we constantly remember what occurred, there's nothing to stop this from happening again. Um, right. and, and that worries me a lot. Yeah. Well, how difficult was it? And we'll talk in the bonus segment a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of this for people mm-hmm. who want to follow the path that you're, you've blazed here. How difficult was it to get this made? Did you have to put a lot of you know your own money into it? Did you, how did you find partners to create it? Because there is not a lot of people out there, especially in the comic space, mm-hmm. that are going to be open to something that is necessarily critical of COVID, the, the regime of what people, you know, the leftist nation had, had aligned themselves with. So I'm curious to hear a little bit about that, how that came to fruition. So, well, fortunately with comics, there's one name here who made the whole thing and that's me. So uh, I didn't need anyone else to help me. Um, mm-hmm. I could do the whole thing myself. It's the beauty of comics as opposed to other, like making a film. Uh, I work at Free the People, make a lot of documentaries. I have to work with other people. It's terrible. The, you, you need to do it. You need other people to make those things. So comics, uh, all it cost me to make the thing was my um, my time and uh, you know ink and brushes and things like that, which on the scale of things is pretty cheap. Um, the as far as the publisher is concerned, I have a great publisher called Living the Line, and uh, Sean, the publisher there, is a like production whiz i think it's why the book like looks and feels as good as it does and it's a good hefty book by the way i mean you can hurt somebody if you swing it at somebody's (laughs) head you can hurt them it's got a sharp corners it's It's really yeah it's got a nice the paper's good good stock and all that um it's literally it's really lovely and uh you know sean sean has um he just wants to publish good books and so you know we have the benefit of it he's a small publisher but um you can take risks and you don't have to be afraid about what you're putting out necessarily. Uh, that's the other beauty of comics is that it is a small enough of a space that while like, you know, Marvel and DC weren't going to put a house on fire out, but also I would never want them to put it out because then they'd own it. And why would I want right. them to own, own it? Um, so, and and so because the scales are smaller, you can, I think you can get away with more. I just don't think that there's a lot of people there are a lot of people doing that. I mean, there's a lot of, definitely a ton of people doing stuff on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and things like that. Um, I just, I don't see a lot of like, um, the way that I'm starting to think of House and Fire is it's a, it's a book for adults. Uh, it, you know, it would be rated PG-13 and the reason would be, mm-hmm. you know, adult themes and one scene of violence or something like that. <laughs> but uh, 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 I would like to see see more of that. I think that a lot of people, um, we need to have more adult uh uh, I'm going to say adult entertainment, but obviously I don't mean pornography. I mean, <laughs> I mean things that speak to adults in an emotional sense. Um, yeah. And I think that's important. So, well, we talk about the comic book industry as a whole. Like you said there's Marvel, there's DC, there's kind of this entire culture war going on. I think between mm-hmm. the people who grew up with comics and which were very sexualized on both sides. You know, the men were men and they were very muscly and the women always Uh had low cut tops. And now there's been this kind of revolution. And I think uh, there's a a comic writer who writes cyber frog. I think his name is Ethan Van Shire. Mm -hmm. And he's pushing back against it as are several other people. But where do you think things are going with, within that industry? Do you think that it's pushed past the Rubicon where everybody's just sick of this now and saying enough of this woke crap, enough trying to rein in what we enjoyed with comics. Let's get back to it being goofy with, you know, big tits and muscles, or do you think that it's just gone too far and it has to come to independent publishers like you and some others? Well, I think it's funny. I think the whole argument is kind of, it's kind of silly to me because I think it's a fixation on superhero, like legacy superhero characters who have been around for 60 plus years in a lot of these cases. And I think they're running on fumes as far as comics are concerned, because they've, you know, I mean, how many Batman stories do you have? (laughs) Like, and so I, I, I'm happy that a lot of these people who criticize what Marvel and DC are doing as far as, you know, whatever woke stuff or, or whatever, um, they're going out and making their own books. And I think that again, it's comics is an easy medium to produce your own thing and you can get it out there. You can market it and publish it. It's not 
it's not all that hard, honestly. And so I think it's better that people create alternatives than um, us fixate on trying to fix what is essentially a property owned by some mega corporation that mm. like, I just, I don't care what Marvel and DC do with these characters. The books that I grew up reading, I still own those ones. The ones that matter to me, like I kept those and you know, I have them in print. They're not going to change. They're not going to go anywhere. I, I, as a, you know, a uh, 34 year old with a child and different concerns. I don't really, I'm not reading superhero books. I don't care anymore. Like, yeah. and is my daughter going to read superhero books? I, I doubt it. Um, she'll find something else that she likes and there's plenty of options out there. Uh, and I have no desire to force her to read Marvel and DC because it's what I read growing up. I, there's hopefully there's something better for her. Uh, yeah, better and you know? new. I mean, that is right? definitely something that I think goes through all entertainment, be it comic books, be it film and TV, is this over-reliance on existing IP. It's, t it's terrible. And it's awful. It, rebooting it, expanding it. And granted, I know that there's an allure to that. So as you said, there's legacies. People like what they like, mm -hmm. and they get stuck in their ways. But I think a lot of the criticism, as you said, does come from you know, giving Superman a gay son right. all of a sudden and you go, yeah, hey, there you go. We're shoving down your throat. So people get pissed about that. But at the same yeah, time, I, I get that. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense or race switching characters, which uh, annoys the living shit out of me personally, mm -hmm. because the most valid criticism I have of that though, is as you said, they can do what they want. It's their property, but create new characters. You know, this is what black America is saying. At least the, the people I think that would agree with our philosophy is don't give me an existing character. Don't give me a black April O'Neil. Create a new character that has her own mythology that's in her own right interesting to me, not just because you gave her black skin and she's existing character that you think is going to get somebody to, to tune in. Yeah, and I, I feel like, though, um, in some of these cases, there's a weird incentives problem with why they don't... Like, if you create a new character at Marvel or DC there's not really a lot of incentives for you, the creator to do that, to give them a good new idea because they'll make a movie or whatever they want to make with it. And you get, you know, a couple grand as, as recompense. Certain and, and, and you lose your control as payback and you don't yeah. have control. Right. Yeah. So why would you, why would you do something new for them? Um, and, and so I get that. And, but I also feel like that the, I, I just, I just feel like the, they, they don't, um, I just don't think that they have new ideas to do with these characters. And so now they're stuck in this sort of inward looking loop because they can't make, they don't want to make up new villains, which is what would spice it up. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to make up new like heroes. Um, and so you can't change the status quo too much, but you can change like, you know, if you change the sexuality of a character, then it's like, well, we can add in a new relationship and then we can toy right. with that for 20 issues or whatever um, without having to uh, make anything new of value, which again, I am of the opinion that the sooner that these like large legacy characters die off and become actual just legacies, or even honestly, what would be great is if they just become public domain, the yeah. better off we are as a culture. Um, I think that we've been too long I, the fact that there is an, another Indiana Jones movie coming out, which <laughs> I will probably go see because I am a sucker for Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones. It's not going to be good. But the fact that like that we're seeing a fourth one and Harrison Ford is like in his eighties. Why? Like well, just make something new at that point. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We don't know? need Harrison Ford, Ford in uh, Indiana Jones and the, uh, you know, mystery of the replacement hip. This is not alluring. <laughs> Although I have been told it's Shia LaBeouf lifts. Well, so that's good. No Shia LaBeouf in this one. Yeah, um, but they'll put something else in that's worse, right? Oh, so uh, there's going to be, well, it's going to be like the Bond thing. I guarantee there's going to be the handoff character in this movie. Without I, a doubt. It's I have be the thoughts character. on James Bond, but I, I, I love Bond. That's the one where it's like, you know, I think James Bond should go on forever. I, but, look at uh, it, I love it. And it's built in I, that they say at different per, different people could be 007. Fine. It's kind of like Doctor Who. <laughs> Right? Ah, uh, disagree. Can... disagree. No? Uh, All right. I mean, I, immutable look, Sean, character. <laughs> Sean Connery is my favorite 007, but I can get that they're like, look, it's just a number assignment. Whatever. Yeah, this no, is no, our no, world. No, no, no. <laughs> Sean Connery, George Lazenby, Timmy, or Timothy Dalton, Roger Moore, Pierce Brosnan, Daniel Craig, they're all the same guy. All right. 
if you say so. And I, I am fine with that interpretation as well, but I'm trying to give them the ability to change it. But I, at least I get it. Yeah. To your point, though, about adding that that different sex option, it, it really mm-hmm. does open up. So I can see your point in that this is the way to keep it fresh. It's but a soap I opera. Also, I, I agree completely. But I think you make a really salient point, and I hadn't really thought about that before, is that the incentive structure completely doesn't exist for new characters to be brought into it. I mean, before, when no. you had Marvel, I mean, Stan Lee created what half of those characters and the well, other half. Were, I mean, well, mean or Steve Stoll, Ditko, uh, Steve or Ditko and Jack Kirby yeah. did, but yes. Well, I was going well, to say, <laughs> as, as well as some of these other creator founders, but the incentive was still there because it was a company getting off the ground. It wasn't this monolith company now where you, as you said, you're going to lose any control. Right. And it doesn't make sense for you to, to just lump in that in that realm unless it's kind of a, a character you want to throw away to do something else. I guess you could say you'll make your name and then leapfrog to something different. But if you're going to take your shot, typically you're probably going to use your strongest piece of IP to do it. So, mm-hmm. again, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you even make the attempt. Precisely. Yeah, and that's why you've seen a lot of um, a lot of comics creators, they go to the big two and then they leave and they do mm-hmm. their own creator-owned series and they do – like the, and that's where they make their, you know, and because you build your audience at the at the legacy, and then you go into your own thing. So, yeah, I just I I don't know. I think a lot of people worry about it, but I've made my peace with the fact that I just I'm not going to read superhero comics anymore, and I'm very okay with that. I have mm-hmm. no qualms about it. I used yeah. to read The Punisher frequently, and. Uh, they Garth Ennis stopped writing it basically, or they stopped putting out Garth Ennis Punisher stories. And I was like, great, I'm done. I don't need, I, I do not need to collect anymore. And frankly, I've tried other ones and none of them are even remotely as good. So I don't want more. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And plus they're too damn expensive. That uh, too. <laughs> Cause I used to collect comics. I was like, well, you're, uh, it's like four bucks comics? for a floppy, <laughs> which is insane. Beyond ridiculous. So 22 pages <laughs> that doesn't even wrap up. Right. Exactly. All right. So one more thing on the, on the book. And then so we'll, we'll do a little current events, topical sure. stuff. One of which I think kind of ties in well with what we're discussing here with uh, a little bit of race swap and art, but <laughs> we're both, fathers right we were talking a little mm-hmm. bit that uh, before we came on properly we're both fathers how much of what's going on right now do you have in the back of your mind when you do write something like this that you is a, a projectable future on what we're living right now something that obviously is terrifying but within the realm of reality to the point where it becomes a pretty grave concern as we do have these young you know i have two daughters are bringing into the world now so where mm-hmm. does that weigh in on what you're doing and I guess the inspiration behind it, did did it set your ass on fire to write house on fire? (laughs) Um, You know, when I, uh, when I, I purposely didn't include anything about like kids in the book because I didn't want to jinx anything for myself. (laughs) Um, But you'll happily have your wife die from a medical uh, ailment. (laughs) Is that what you're telling me? You're willing to put her on on the paper (laughs) and jinx her. What a horrible person you are. Terrible I guess husband. She, she did. She did get COVID. So. Oh, there you go. This is all your fault. <laughs> but I did get jumped, so it's kind of even. Oh God. Oh, yeah. God. This is like this so. is turning into a into a Tales from the Crypt uh, episode or a or a, a, a so, Twilight Zone. <laughs> um, and I had I had written it before. Um, you know, I had I basically the finishing. I think I had finished like inking most of the pages. The story was set by like pretty good in, but I think that having a child is it's definitely going to inform everything I do from here on. I have a you know a little afterword in the book that basically just says I hope that when she can read it, that a lot of the things in the book are going to feel more fictional again. Um, Mm. I don't. I'm worried that that's not going to be true, Um, but one can hope. I I you know the next book that I want to do is is uh focused on our relationship with technology and social media and things like that because that's the next thing that really worries me about having a kid is yeah how do you protect them from all of that stuff or how do you explain it i mean i uh i was lucky enough to go through high school and up most of college without i think i was a senior in college when like everyone started getting iphones and so I was lucky, fortunate to not have 
you know, so much on record basically. And so I, yeah. I, I, the, what it's going to be like for a kid growing up today with all of this stuff is that scares me. And, and it, it worries me that it's a uh, somewhat inescapable part of our culture now, it seems. So. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm struggling with that myself. And there's so much social contagion as far as things that challenge your, your kids, especially women. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got two daughters and you I see, have one daughter. So yeah. Same so page. coming. Yeah, exactly. It's coming at you. And you see like on TikTok, for instance, these instances of people developing Tourette's syndrome or at least mm-hmm. emulating it because they saw influence with Tourette's and you go, this is unbelievably fucked. Yeah. And the challenge then is, you know, as you said, weighing, do I allow my daughter to have this tech and use it uh, or, and, and risk, the potential of something bad happening to her in this way of being, you know, all these different issues that stem from it, depression and loneliness and, you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Or do I deny her that ability, making her ostensibly an outcast in the digital realm, yeah. uh, inviting potential bullying in person rather than online and then weighing the benefits and risk. And honestly, at this point, I'm, I am, I think I'm pretty solidly on I'd rather she get bullied in real life. And I think it's the less dangerous option. But honestly, see, see what's happening right now. I mean, it's so concerning to me. Unfortunately, I won't have to deal with it for another probably seven years, but it's terrifying, man. It is. I, I you know, I think that uh, you can't like deny it, be, deny the existence of it to your kid. Cause that, that creates a bigger yeah. problem, I think. Um, yeah. So I, I I guess you just got to hope, hope that you can explain it and give them tools to, uh, to, to grapple with it. And, and to, you know, I I think the thing to, to keep in mind for people is that your, your self-worth and value is not how many likes or followers you have online. Now I am selling a book. So obviously the more followers (laughs) I get would be great if you want to to, like, share, subscribe to your, yeah, I'll link link to all of your uh, your Twitters and where people can buy the book on on the show notes. But it's not that we're hypocrites, but we know what we're, it's knowing what the purpose of the thing is. And, Mm -hmm. and I worry like a thing, like a TikTok, which I I am not on and I refuse to go on. It doesn't make any sense to me is I don't know what the purpose is. And I guess it's the same as everything else where it's sort of self-promotional nonsense, but, uh, I just, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's terrifying (laughs) and I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And there are many pitfalls. As you said, you and I didn't have a lot out there. Of course, now I do. People can end my career 50 times over. No problem. But there is that, that pitfall of what stupid shit is she going to post on social media? What trend is she going to follow on TikTok? That's now going to be findable, searchable, uh, you know, a digital record of everything stupid ever said and ever done. Right. can you imagine your college years recorded like they are today? I, I can't. No. I, and I wouldn't want, I, I mean, like no one wants to be accountable for who they were at like 20 when you're, you know, closing it on 40. Like that's insane. Cause if you're the same person, that's a different problem. But like, I feel like kids today are now going to be, um, I mean, there are so many parents who are putting stuff up of their kid as like a toddler on the internet. Yeah. And it's like... I hate that. I've got a, I've got a couple. I share one, one picture every few months, maybe of me and a kid. I have a private Instagram. That's only for friends and family to follow. So that's yeah. don't put yeah, it Yeah. Because world, you but... do always have those relatives who are like, Oh, can I want a picture of the baby? Can I see a picture of the baby? Yeah. And then you just, you don't feel like texting them constantly. Cause then you have to right. deal with answering text messages from them all the time. And so, yeah, yeah you throw one up to appease yeah. people. And but... it's, it's convenient in that way in that you say, okay, and especially my parents are in Florida, I'm in Los Angeles, yeah. so they don't get to see each other that often. So they can watch the kid grow up online. Great. But mm-hmm. it's private. You know, there's yeah. 30 people that have that link and, and that's kept to myself and we'll see. I was deleted eventually, but yeah, <laughs> you don't want that public record out there in, and I do think it's a perverse incentive that people have you said the addiction to likes, even going beyond the younger generation into what's going on with millennials and Gen Z and all this other thing of even that, like, it's just fodder. Having the child is fodder for their own ego, which I guess mm-hmm. you could argue that having children is always an exercise in ego because we want our genetic <laughs> material to go out in the world and prosper, but still. I- I guess so. I, yeah. I, 
I don't know. I think it's also a selfless thing because they take up all your time. I mean, I, I would I like know. to do another book. I don't know when I'm going to get a chance. <laughs> Story of my life, man. I'm working on a book right now, and I got yeah, trying to find time to do any of it. Well, right. anyway, let's let's go to a different topic here. So we'll do some some current event stuff. Oh wait, wait, um, wait real quick, real quick. Yeah, uh, this is uh, you got to get this. Oh one. yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the and 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 I'll show you this. The Batman where he rescues uh, yeah. Ludwig von Mises. Says, yeah, von Mises is written against Nazi policy, Herr Wayne. He's been very critical of our decisions. <laughs> I love it. All right, I you got to get, get it. I'll send it. That's I'll awesome. send you a listing or whatever. Yeah, please do. That's awesome. So this is a perfect segue because I wanted to talk about this story that CNN published. One of the most ridiculous things I personally have seen, and it was – an article written by somebody named John Blake, the analysis by John Blake, an article called What's Digital Blackface and Why Is It Wrong When White People Use It? Perfect uh -huh. segue since we're talking about the pitfalls of social media. And obviously now we have a new one to worry about, which is digital blackface. So my question to you is, mm -hmm. as an artist, as a creator, do you feel that if what you know, if somebody's on television, if they have a something from a TV show, from a work of art, whatever it might be, even if they're black, should we be able to use this as white men and incorporate it into our own points, into our own art, into our own culture and lexicon, or is yeah. it <laughs> stealing digital blackface? <laughs> uh, I I feel like it's an easy easy one in that uh, if you're. Yeah, I don't think that there should be a problem with it. I think that I, I don't know, all art or I don't, memes are just like sharing things, right? Like, so I can't yeah. use like a, uh, memes with a, no. That, that was what this this guy's saying. You there's can't that use one memes. meme. <laughs> it, it, there's it can't use that that funny thing of the woman. It's like ain't nobody got yeah. time for that. Not allowed about, to use that. <laughs> what about the meme where there's the? <laughs> it's a funny. The kid he's got he's a. He's got a, uh, he's looking at his computer and they put his hand down his pants in the second one. <laughs> well, it's like, or that, it's or, a great reaction gif. Yeah. <laughs> Meme. Well, or you mentioned like whatever you know, these, these great news clips that are out there, right? You said yeah. your dad was, are you from Philly or is uh, I'm from dad? North Jersey. I, uh, I, you know what I've appropriated uh, Philly culture because I've gotten the IGA that I used to live near all of their announcements were in a Delco accent. So I kind of slip <laughs> into it occasionally, uh, but I am actually, I'm a Giants fan in Eagles country. So. Okay. So well, here. I'm an Eagles fan and now Rams and uh, Chargers country, but I'm a Philly yeah, guy. But at originally. least they're weak fans. They're not oh, they're terrible. Fans. Fans. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to easily taken over and bullied, but <laughs> there's, there's a great news segment. You probably saw, which was that in Philly, there was a fireman, black fireman, and happened to be in the middle of a season when Nelson Aguilar, who was our wide receiver, had dropped all these easy passes. Uh -huh. And he's out there. He's going, well, we're catching babies, unlike Aguilar. <laughs> it's like one of the funniest things I've ever seen or heard in my life. Uh -huh. It was amazing. Like, classic Philly. But it's a black man. Does that mean yeah. I can't share this meme, this hilarious meme? Is, no, I can't you have a to. Joke around? Right? That's I mean, a, it's a classic meme. It's, a, it's absolutely classic. And it's just to convey a point. And, you know, for me, it's like half the time these people – Number one, it's either news clips or from you know, television shows yeah. or something that they put out there into the world intentionally to get likes, to get clicks, to get whatever it was. So you're creating this to be shared, number one, or you are actively taking part in something you know is going to be out there for public consumption. Yeah. So uh, sharing the memes is just supporting the digital economy. I, I right. mean, what else does all of the social media run on if not memes? Yeah. Well, so. and their argument that this guy's making in this piece, let me let me read this this little bit, is basically arguing that we are using them, right? See, this is okay, so this is a, a quote in this article that is taken from a uh an advocate. Oh, sorry, this is an essay for Teen Vogue from Lauren Ooh. Michelle Jackson. Uh -huh. Oh, Teen Vogue, which has become somehow a, a hot button for race and trans and whatever else. Teen Vogue. T Teen Vogue is known for astute takes on all things. So it's, it's I think we should actually let's back <laughs> off of this. Uh, Teen Vogue's on it. I don't want to talk about this anymore. You don't want to get the Teen <laughs> They've Vogue. They've settled it you. already. Yeah, it's <laughs> they're, done. They're a powerful lobby. 
<laughs> well, here's here's this quote. We are your sass, not your nonchalance, your fury, your delight, your annoyance, your happy dance, your diva, your shade, your yas moments. Uh, the weight of reaction, jiffing period, rests on our shoulders. Now, that is very egomaniacal, by the way, to say that black people are oh, the only ones used for this and that there's not a million gifs of white people and Zach Galifianakis and anybody else doing stupid shit. Uh -huh. But her point somehow that you should be denied emoting through these things. And essentially what you're doing is much like when you read a comic, when you read a graphic novel, you are finding something emotionally that you're connecting with and you want to share that. You want, you're want you taking part of that and you're putting out in the world and you're saying, look, this is how I feel and I want to express this visually. Yeah. And that is what memes do and that is what these GIFs do. And there's there's no fucking problem with that. <laughs> No, it's, 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 I, th I feel like it's just, it's just, uh, people need to find are constantly looking for, uh, stuff too. And, and we're in the trap. We're in the trap. Like this is if we, you know, let's step outside of ourselves. We're all trapped in this thing where we're finding aggressively more stupid things <laughs> to be like, this is upset. I'm upset now that people are getting likes on stuff that they shouldn't be allowed to share. And it's like, we've already established that likes are meaningless. Mm -hmm. And so wait, I, I, the, the CNN guy, I mean, that's like a, you know, he's got, he's on some sort of internet broke brain thing for even coming up with a take. Like Obviously. there's just people whose brains are just melted by the internet. And I, I don't know what to do with them. Like what, how are you supposed to like, what kind of therapy do they need to like get off of the juice? Well, it's like, well, the therapy is to, and I'm guilty because I'm talking about this stupid yes. article, is to stop talking about it. Yeah, that's the thing. But we're, we're hooked to, we're hooked to we're the trapped. juice. But we're trapped. But it's kind of funny. It, we're talking about legacy superheroes, right? And how the only thing they can do now is, you know, slap a vagina on Superman or whatever it might be. This is the legacy superhero of the left. It's yeah. racism. Yeah, it's right. I mean, it is. This is this is the mighty legacy superhero. So this is the only option they have is to come up with a new stupid thing to tie race into and be outraged over at any point. And I think this so also ties in. Oh, go ahead. We're just waiting for this to go public domain, too. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, Mickey Mouse is going to be public domain, I think, next year. Sweet. Yeah, uh, Disney's going to replace him because, you know, they got to own it. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> the last thing I want to add on this topic, and then we'll, we'll get into like one more thing and then we'll, we'll, sure. uh, we'll go to the bonus show, is just that I found it so interesting that I think partially also this argument that it's digital blackface to use these emotive gifts or memes is based also in the less desire to control perception. And much of that is perception of black people right and, you know because there's there's this argument that they are you know we have to hold these people up on high on a pedestal and white people are to blame for everything and black people are up here and they've been you know uh, crushed under under the feet so i think that it's also an effort to control perception and a lot of what's being shared in these memes are, are the funnier moments or goofier things so if you're trying to control a perception of black culture as you know downtrodden and victims and you know and everything the left paints them as having all of these these memes out there that people use that, that are probably actually doing a benefit or a service to the overall acceptance of black culture and black american just seeing them as everybody else that's out there to try to control that is a tactic that they're using because it aids in this reshaping that they're trying to attempt what are your thoughts on that I don't know. I was also thinking too, though, that like, is it, is it's kind of a, they assume that people are laughing at rather than with like the whole, yeah, I don't for know. Sure they do. Yeah, for it, sure. It, it, <laughs> it just comes from the super negative place because they're all miserable. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I just, I, I wish people would kind of, uh, take people a little bit more on good faith. I don't think that people sharing, uh, memes is, uh, is done usually with, uh, Malicious like malice. intent. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't I think mean, so either. <laughs> or, what, what, so you can't watch cho the Chocolate Rain video again anymore? Nope. Off the limits. <sighs> Digital blackface. Classic. And that guy, guy yeah. that guy could argue. I mean, he was the whitest man well in the world, that, too. I think. He, he, oh, he, God, yeah. he did pretty good. For Chocolate sure. Rain. That was, oh, I dated myself with that one, though, right? Like, that was, <laughs> that was like early. That wasn't even a GIF, was it? That was, that was the start of the internet. Yeah, that was like yeah. one of the original YouTube videos. did not exist to... when that was out. No, it did not. <laughs>
All right, last thing we'll talk about here is uh, something that was pretty interesting. I was going to talk a little bit about the Israel situation, but eh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. It's just kind of Netanyahu, uh, you know, protest because he's trying to change the judicial system essentially to excuse himself and make it more difficult to replace him. But let's skip over that. We don't want to get on the bad side of the IDF. We can't we can't get on the bad side of the IDF and APAC and Teen Vogue in one episode. No, <laughs> that's, that's bad. <laughs> instant destruction. <laughs> but one thing we can talk about, which I thought was pretty fascinating, is that uh, El Salvador has a bill that was put forward by the president uh Ni- or actually this guy is yeah, President Naib Bukele. I'm sure I did not pronounce Sounds that perfect. correctly. Nailed it. Uh, he's putting forth a bill, which essentially, and this is just me kind of, you know, summing it up is going to eliminate capital gains, taxes, uh, profits, taxes, all sorts of different incentives on anything technology related in El Salvador. Now, of course, El Salvador famously has adopted Bitcoin as well as its currency. So what do you think about this hard lean into what I would argue is the model that every nation should follow, especially if you're trying to encourage investment technology and uh, the betterment of your society would be to give incentives to people to create. Yeah. I think that sounds great. I wonder what the asterisks are on it. Uh, yeah. I, that they, I, own, I, they own everything that, that yeah. they create in the city. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like what, you know, obviously there, there's definitely some catch cause it is the government. So yeah. you, you certainly can't, can't uh, trust it. You know, I mean, I, I, I thought that there was some, um, isn't isn't there some debate over like the bitcoin situation down there because it's government accepted so therefore it's not bad or it's not good i mean or something i you know i to be honest i have to look into and i I need to do more homework on this i haven't really done a big episode on it on what how well it's going number one (laughs) and yeah what the what the effects of having bitcoin used there as a currency would be now i mean considering the inflation that's going on everywhere else, having Bitcoin in there, even though there's ups and downs, probably isn't a terrible idea. But because of that fluctuation that can happen with big sell-offs, if you're using that in your everyday purchasing power, going in and out as a society, it's a little tricky. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, because it's literally a day, it can be a day-to-day fluctuation (laughs) of, you know, 20%. And you're like, okay, well, eggs are 20% more expensive today. Okay, shit. (laughs) Well... That's not different than what we're living with, but um, well, true. I I wonder though. I guess the question is: is is government is their government regulating like all of these industries in in, in any sort of way? Like especially with Bitcoin, I know that I wouldn't want the U.S. government making Bitcoin our um, you know money because then the government is going to regulate it and right. they just end up using Bitcoin to track you more than they already are and et cetera, et cetera. It'd be bad. Um, yeah. So I wonder, and, and arguably, the Federal Reserve could influence the price of Bitcoin just by going on exchanges and right. buying a shit ton of it or selling a shit ton. Yeah. So I don't know. It sounds great on paper, like the headline. It's a great headline. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I just, uh, I guess, with everything, anytime there's a government involved, you you gotta take a very healthy, large mm-hmm. dose of skepticism. I would agree, but I do like it. I think from the perspective, simply of the fact that they're introducing it Uh, because it's something that I've advocated for, you know, when you talk about special economic zones and actually on Monday's show, um, which we're recording on Monday, but they don't need to know that until I told them. Uh, John Odermatt talked to a guy named Alex Voss, who's working with, uh, and I'm blanking on the name of the actual foundation, but it's in the show notes, but essentially to create private cities. And, you know, with these special economic zones and Rand Paul's talked about different special economic zones before and how they've been put into place in cities. I like that it's actually getting into the context of conversation, though, as an option to say no taxes on an industry. Now, is it still playing favorites? Yes, because obviously you're pushing up tech over other industries. So is it fair? No. But it comes down to at least somebody's getting the break. And, you know, and I'm happy if anybody gets the fucking break. And at least now it's getting out there where other governments can consider this. And I will need to look into the bill once it's put forth, once somebody translates it, because obviously I don't speak Spanish fluently, and find out what those catches are. Because I think, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it's something where it's a limited time period. I'm sure it's not in perpetuity. Right. I'm sure it's, you have a five-year period and then maybe they tax you on your past revenues. That wouldn't shock me if that was in there, you know? So, well, we'll I mean, uh, in Philly, they were doing the, uh, they were waiving property taxes for, mm-hmm. I don't know, new development, I believe. 
And I, I think it, it I mean, it, it has, it has different effects where, I mean, they've overdeveloped a lot of sections of Philly and they've got these huge, they're putting up huge apartment buildings everywhere. And it's uh, you know, they actually had to demolish one, which is actually one of the locations in here uh, is the, the power plant that he goes yeah. to. That's uh, that's now condos. Um. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> is it going to be like China cities? They're like go to smallish ghost cities now. It's like, yeah, empty, they just, empty buildings that nobody them. I just feel fast. like that's, what's going to, that's going to happen. But um I know that I do always worry when government picks their winners and losers through these incentive structures, like how that, how that goes. We've seen it with, with a lot of green energy companies in the U S where it's all super corrupt. um, And those companies don't end up doing well. And a lot of them go under and it's a slush fund, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, So, but I understand if you're El Salvador and you're trying to get tech investment, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, didn't Tim Scott do something with the um, economic zone somewhere too? I do. I remember that correctly. He did. I can't remember where, I mean, they've tried it in a few different places and it's been mm-hmm. successful where they've tried it, but yeah. it's nowhere near to the extent that El Salvador's proposed. There, there's okay. a, a more bold proposal. Um, but again, we'll have to see what the actual bill says. But I guess the size of El Salvador is not, you, you wouldn't necessarily do it nationally in the U S but you'd, do it on a state by state basis. And isn't yeah. that the kind of the beauty of federalism is that people can do different things and try things yeah. out. Supposed to be, you know, I'm sure that <laughs> without a doubt, it's like a sort of some state tried to do this, they, they would be attacked on some level by the federal yeah, government. I mean, breaking uh, some sort of regulation. I'm doing this bullshit optimism thing, which is just, <laughs> <laughs> I try to too, man. I try I'm trying. To. I'm trying. (laughs) All right. Well, I'll tell you what, even though we're talking optimism, uh, you guys should check out House on Fire. It is not an optimistic look at our future, but it is it is a very, Uh very good read. Uh, I think you guys are going to love it. It's a beautifully drawn, beautifully paced. And I think that without a doubt, as we talked about earlier, it is something that has to be done. We need more of these cultural milestones that are going to exist. They're going to document what we've gone through and warn people as to the future. So Matt, thank you for coming on, man. Any last uh, thoughts about the book, about uh, the future, about life, your favorite recipe, whatever you want to add. Uh, Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, People can buy the the book. It's on Amazon. It'll be in, it's in Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can order it on Target online if you uh, also are buying a lot of diapers at Target. Uh, <laughs> it's so you can also go to my website, matchabat.com, and that has links. Um, check out my work at Free the People, freethepeople.org. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, favorite, favorite recipe I do a great meatball. That's my people clamor for that's this. literally what i'm making for dinner tonight i shit you oh, not fantastic. i also do a great meatball i am okay. I'm making meatballs for the family that's well, as soon as we're done here i gotta roll them and get them in the oil um, oh, awesome luck. well guys matt patagula check it out house on fire we're gonna do a little bonus segment here talking about the creative process of, of getting this all all done and made so join us on patreon if you are able otherwise matt thank you so much for joining me on Age daydream buddy thank you all right from me from matt I want to wish you all a, uh, a very good day, a wonderful goodbye from the Lions Liberty Network, and a reminder to keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head.